Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. As usual, just a couple of announcements. The first thing is that the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course starts tomorrow. And uh, some of you know about this course and we do offer it three times a year, but we only offer it one time a year with the celebrity instructors, which include um, rock stars like Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Dr. Neil Barnard, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, Dr. Mark Schultz, um, the list goes on and on. So you don't want to miss this phenomenal opportunity to be live and interactive from the comfort of your home via our virtual classroom interactive teleconference uh, system uh, with people like this and learn from them. It's a unique experience. I've been hosting these calls for probably I don't know, it's got to be seven or eight years now, and I always learn something new every time I listen to these people speak. So lots of uh, detailed slides, CME credits for docs, CEs for nurses and dietitians, don't miss it. Uh, second thing is a week from Monday, I guess Monday actually, um, is the first in the uh, nutrition and cancer class um, series that I'll be teaching this summer. Uh, this is a 10 lecture series on Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. And we'll be covering all kinds of things like diet for prevention, diet for treatment, um, looking at theories of causation of cancer, which go to what types of diets would work, and looking at this debate about ketogenic diets and alternative treatments and all that sort of thing. It's a fascinating class. Um, I'm having a fascinating time just putting it together and can't wait to share the information. And then one last thing, if you're a member for Wellness Farm Health, we actually want to give you $25. And so if you want to know more about that and you are a member, uh, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com and I'll write back to you and tell you what you have to do to get the $25, okay? All right, so I've got a couple of interesting topics I want to talk about. And the first one is the role of exercise in overcoming addiction. Ask anybody with a drinking or drug problem or a longtime smoker how easy it is to quit and they will all tell you it is very easy because most of them have done it dozens and dozens of times. The problem is not the quitting, the problem is the um, continuation of abstinence and uh, it's becoming increasingly clear that much, much of the traditional treatment recovery programs that are offered to substance abusers really don't have much of a positive impact and better solutions are needed. Well, one really inexpensive, easily accessible option is exercise and it's been proven to help people with all types of uh, substance abuse. So understanding how exercise can help starts with an understanding about how addiction can develop. Dopamine is a pleasure mediating neurotransmitter released in the brain as a means for making sure that humans engage in activities that ensure the perpetuation of our species like eating, we have to do that, and having sex and reproduction. Other activities though also stimulate the release of dopamine like taking drugs and drinking alcohol. Over time what happens is that as people take increasingly in, larger amounts of drugs and alcohol. They do this because the amount of dopamine release becomes lower and lower. So it takes more of these substances in order to get the same feeling of high or whatever it is that you're looking for as a result of using these substances. Well, discontinuing use causes intense cravings and depression um, and all kinds of things. It's, it's very difficult to withdraw from drugs and alcohol if you're an abuser. Exercise has been shown to increase dopamine production, which may be why so many studies have shown that physical activity reduces cravings and can be helpful in addressing drug and alcohol abuse. In one study conducted at Vanderbilt University, researchers had cannabis addicts participate in 10 30-minute treadmill sessions during a two-week period of time at 60 to 70 percent of their maximum heart rate. The exercise sessions resulted in a 50 percent drop in cannabis use. That's pretty good. Another study conducted in London, just 10 minutes of moderate intensity cycling was shown to reduce alcohol cravings in adults who had recently completed a treatment program. One review showed that exercise could be helpful at all stages of addiction, no matter which substance an individual becomes habituated to. The lead author, Wendy Lynch, says that exercise can serve as an alternative to drugs and can be used as a means to prevent relapse. Exercise may even be valuable in preventing drug and alcohol abuse in the first place. The same review reported that teenagers engaging in consistent physical activity were significantly less likely to begin smoking cigarettes or using illicit drugs. One of the ways in which exercise can facilitate recovery is to assist in the repair of some of the damage done to the brain during long periods of substance abuse. 
brain-derived neurotropic factor, or BDNF, assists in brain cell communication and cognition, and also increases the production of GABA, a neurotransmitter that, that assists humans in achieving feelings of calmness and lowering anxiety. Exercise increases the production of BDNF, which can help to restore brain function and reduce anxiety, which can in turn then reduce the risk of relapse. There are many stories of people who've used exercise, particularly running, as a means for overcoming addiction. Caleb Daniloff describes his own experience in a recent Runner's World article. After years of alcohol and drug abuse, Daniloff credits his running with transformation from a self-loathing addict into living a joyous life without relapse for 18 years. That's a pretty remarkable accomplishment when you think about it. Some say he's traded one addiction for another. Daniloff disagrees, but does acknowledge that the recovering addict may have an advantage with endurance sports like marathon running. Addiction requires pain tolerance, single-minded focus, and a level of comfort spending time alone, which can be helpful when you're training for an endurance event. He says, quote, for a sober person, the greatest gift running can give is its ability to render us human while simultaneously showing us the strength that we have. I'm a subscriber to Runner's World magazine, and every couple months they run stories on people, featuring people who have overcome amazing things, ranging from addiction to loss of a, a loved, loved one to um, war injuries, um, and running has helped them to deal with the issues surrounding those things. Well, in addition to the often unpleasant physical symptoms of withdrawing from substance abuse, individuals are faced with two other very important issues. One is lots of free time. Abusing drugs and alcohol is a very time-consuming endeavor. Um, and often loneliness. Uh, abusers have often spent most of their time with other abusers, and they sometimes lack social connections with healthy people. Running, cycling, competitive events, and other athletic activities are constructive ways to spend time. And while you can't say this about everybody, generally speaking, the types of people who engage in these types of activities are pretty positive people, healthy folks to hang out with. Substance abuse and addiction are complicated issues and comprehensive approaches are needed in order for people to recover. Exercise has been proven to prevent the onset of abuse and to be a valuable part of a recovery plan. It's inexpensive, it's easily accessible, and there aren't any negative side effects, which means that there's no reason not to encourage people recovering from substance abuse who are, or who want to prevent going in that direction to take up exercise. A lot of other benefits too. All right, let's talk about cholesterol. You'd think we'd never get tired of talking, we would sooner or later get tired of talking about cholesterol, but actually there's no end to the discussion about the cholesterol, and here's one of the reasons why. A large and very noisy group of people made up of journalists, consumers, and people who I consider to be marginal healthcare professionals continues to advocate for a meat and protein based diet. Well, such a diet eventually will increase plasma cholesterol levels in almost everyone. But these people insist that this doesn't matter, that plasma cholesterol is not a marker for coronary artery disease risk and cardiovascular events. Now there's considerable evidence that the stance that these people have on cholesterol is not correct and a new meta-analysis I think should put this to rest once and for all. So a research group reviewed an enormous body of evidence, and I'll describe that to you in a minute, in order to determine if there is a cause and effect relationship between low density lipoproteins or LDL cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. The review included randomized controlled trials, prospective cohort studies, genetic studies, and randomized trials of therapies to lower LDL cholesterol. Over 200 studies involving 2 million subjects and 20 million person years of follow-up with 150,000 cardiovascular events were included, making this the most massive and comprehensive review of the issue ever performed. The conclusion, plasma LDL cholesterol unequivocally increases uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and does so in a, quote, remarkably consistent dose-dependent manner. Researchers report that there is a clear association between the magnitude of exposure of the blood vessels to LDL cholesterol and the risk of cardiovascular disease and the risk increases over time. Advocates, advocates of paleo and other animal foods based eating plans have never been able to defend their recommendations with real scientific evidence and they've never conducted the type of studies or their own studies showing that long-term adherence to their dietary recommendations is safe or promotes better health outcomes. They've always insisted that research is not needed to prove their points and only we who are not so open-minded and forward-thinking hang on to old ideas like insisting on well-structured, peer-reviewed, and published evidence to support statements and recommendations. But here is where we are right now. Even if these people were to have a change of heart, 
and decide to conduct the types of studies that would be needed to substantiate their claims. This would be a fruitless strategy since the body of evidence at this point is so large against their hypothesis that it is statistically impossible for future research to change the conclusions. Bottom line is humans are plant eaters, not carnivores. Um, and uh, this is just the latest in a massive amount of research that always leads back to the same place. That's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you on Thursday with more news.